And as we come around the bend, if you look out the window to your left, you'll see fragments of silicon. Welcome to Fragments of Silicon, European Interview Edition. Uh, first one of these for the new season. Um, and joining us today, I'm happy to report, is John Ingle of Ingle Studios. Hi. Hi, hi. I mean, if you recall, we were supposed to have him a few weeks ago. That ended up getting bungled a bit, but, you know, everything's Sorry. here. Sorry. <laughs> It's fine, it's fine. I mean, you started up a Let's Play series because of it, of your 80s days game. Which is... uh, okay, well, I'm glad that that's a happy ending to that story then, because I felt pretty bad about it. Yeah, but... indeed. Like, but anyway, so, getting into stuff. Um, let's see, uh, as I mentioned before the show started, we like to start things by getting to know the people behind the games, behind the studio, and we like to start at the point of what got interested you? What got you interested in video games, both on a personal and a professional level? Yeah. So I was. You mentioned before the show that that was the first question. So I was thinking about it, and it's it's always that question of how far back do you want to go? Like, well, I, computers were kind of being invented when I was a kid. So, like, I think I. I think my first experience for computer game was when I was eight years old, when I got a book out of the library on how to write computer programs in basic. And I read it because I was interested, but we didn't actually have a computer. So my first experience of games was reading the program for a simple game. It was like a, a, a run and jump Donkey Kong kind of game or something that took up a page in this nice book with big illustrations in it. And I thought that looked cool, but I didn't actually get to play it for like five years later until we actually got a computer. I suppose that wasn't really what sparked my interest in games, though. The first game that I really got into was the old text adventures from Infocom. They made like a version of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and they made some detective games and some sci-fi games. And you typed in what you wanted to do, and it typed out what happened. And I think the first ones we had, they played on your printer. So you typed in a line, and they came out of the printer, and you had to read what came out of the printer. And there was something really magic about that. Um, like, like the computer was doing something it shouldn't be able to do. In those days, computers were rubbish and slow and clunky. I mean, they still are quite. And But this thing could tell you a story. And if you came up with the right idea, if you solved the puzzle or you asked a good question of a character, the game would think for a bit longer. So you'd get this long pause and then the disk drive would chur and then the printer would really start working. And you'd think, yeah, I've really found something. And that idea of discovering things from inside this, this black box of a computer... I think that really caught my fancy. So then I started making games independently, like as a teenager, whichever way I could really. And I carried on doing that and uh, making text adventures actually. And then I did that when I was a student. And then somehow I managed to meet someone at Sony PlayStation. And I showed him one of these text adventures and I just talked about games and they gave me a job. I don't know why they gave me a job, but they gave me a job. So then I was a level designer and then I was a lead designer at. Um, Sony PlayStation in Cambridge for, oh God, it was about five years, I guess, working on completely different stuff. We made like a party game and a, a sci-fi astronaut game that didn't get off the ground. Um, and that's where I met Joe Humphrey, who's the other half of Inkle. And we got to talking about text adventures and storytelling and all these kind of ideas that have been bubbling around in, in my head since I was young. And Joe, Joe was really into visual stuff and graphic design stuff. And he kind of could see ways to make this beautiful and accessible and fun and great for players and it was about the time the ipad came out and that all just came together and that was how we ended up doing starting up inkle and just trying stuff to see what what we could make and and how good it could be and that was about 10 years ago that's kind of what i've been doing with the most of my adult life actually now at this point which kind of feels amazing but like we started on the sorcery series, which was adapting some game books that I read when I was a kid. Um, 
mm-hmm. and having a ton of fun messing around with those. And then 80 Days came along and that kind of made our name and, and got us well recognized. And then the last five years has been working on Heaven's Vault, <laughs> which has just been a ridiculously long and difficult project, but was a lot of fun. And that takes us up to the present. And that's kind of that's the whole journey, I think, sort of starting with an interest and in just seeing where it could take me, really. It's certainly taking you places. Yeah, yeah I seem to be doing this for a living now. And, like, <laughs> I still find that quite surprising. But, um, yeah. That's not the first developer we've had express that kind of opinion. Like, yeah, right. It it still doesn't feel like a job that they told you back at school was on the table. So when you end up with it, you think, is this, am I making this up? Is someone going to take this away tomorrow? Do I actually need to be a postman? Maybe I need to be a postman. I don't know. But um, I'm I mean, enjoying it for now. Yeah. I suppose that's a perception that's changed over the decades because, you know, a lot of the people who are just, let's say, starting out in the industry now, you know, they go to school for this. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I, I have this horrible feeling I'm starting to sound like an old person in interviews. And like, I have stories about computers when they use disks, you know. And <laughs> like, well, you're talking about computers that were around in the 70s with the printouts. Like, uh, yeah, I think I am. I mean, actually, well, we had it in sort of 88. But I think that's because we had really terrible computers because my parents would refuse to buy new ones. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I think we we were kind of lagging behind the curve for a long time when I was growing yeah. up. But, I'm not yeah. Saying, yeah, but you know, it seems to have been a um, definitive experience nonetheless. Since you know, you got immersed in an interactive fiction, as we call it, and yeah. you've been how do I put this? Um, pushing the medium forward, maybe. Yeah, I think it's a weird thing. I mean, it, it the weirdest thing about looking back on it really is that I remember when I was like 20, 25 and I'd be writing these interactive fiction games and just telling people about them, you know, my friends or my family or whoever and saying, Oh, there's this thing and it's called interactive fiction. And I really think it might be quite good. And people would say, yeah, you know, it's a nice idea. It'll never take off. And now I look around the world and I meet all these people and it's their job. It's their life. Like there's this whole cohort of, of 25 year olds now who want to get into interactive fiction and get into interactive fiction because that job exists. And I don't know if the work that we've done has helped to make the space bigger or more popular or just normalize it a bit or whether it would have happened anywhere, who knows. But um, it is kind of incredible to see that change really. And I am excited to see where it, where it goes. And I, mean, I guess how mainstream it can ever get and that's so such an open question all the time is you know will there ever be a bookshop for interactive fiction i, I just I, i'd love to know but yeah it, it hasn't I, I didn't set out for it to be the thing that i did with my entire life and it's a bit terrifying to think it might be but yeah that does seem to be the theme <laughs> life is bizarre at points no yeah. doubt but anyway so focusing in on 80 days um yeah. Yeah, as you mentioned, this is not necessarily your first project, but this is the one that put you on the map, so to speak. Yeah, yeah that's right. It, I mean, it very much wasn't our first project. It was about our sixth, I think. Um, and so by the time we came to it, we really knew, or I felt like we really knew what we were doing. We knew how to how to put text on screen in an interactive way that just flew, that fluidly flowed. And we also knew how to tell interactive stories with the right amount of choice in them that you could actually write them, but that they also felt like you had lots of agency and you could make your own way through it, but they also told a story and they had characters and all, all the different forces that fight against each other when you're trying to put together, well, any kind of story, but an interactive one, especially. And we really felt like we were knew, knew what we were doing. And I think one of the things that looking back on 80 days, cause we, we, we built it in, 2014 i mean the switch version only came out like two months ago and that's out now but so we still went we we do like to go back to it but when we put it together i think we had a, a sense of here's something with a huge scope to it and we reckon we can pull this off and it was quite an exciting it was quite an exciting project to work on because at the time it was easily the hardest thing we'd ever done but there was that sense that it was definitely within our grasp I, I still I didn't think it would do very well. I thought that people would find it too camp and too wordy and not really want to play it. And then when it blew up, it was kind of astonishing to me. But um, but yeah, that was it, it was a really it was one of those projects which at the time we knew it was special, but we didn't realize quite how special it was going to be. 
um, and it changed everything for us, really. Mm. No doubt. And I suppose in terms of like the game, the story itself, what led you to choose to adapt around the world in 80 days in this manner? It's a funny thing. I can't remember where the idea came from originally. Like when you're when you're looking about for ideas of what to do, you tend to have a lot of them. And like Joe and I would have lots of ideas and we would throw them between each other and we would talk about them. And some of them we would talk about for five minutes and some of them we would talk about for five weeks. But and then they go away and then the good ideas come back. And the thing about the 80 days concept was that it just kept on coming back and the more times we looked at it the more we we saw things about it or we saw things in it which which would lend themselves to being something that was worth doing I, th I mean I think at the heart of it was this idea that we wanted to create something which felt um which felt like it had a sense of adventure but without being goofy or cartoony and without being too sort of gritty or grim because i think a lot of a lot of, a lot of the times when people make games because they have to give the player some kind of threat and some kind of challenge they either they either go very dark and you end up with games with a lot of death and killing and murder and destruction and and we all know that kind of game and they can be really exciting but they can also be just really sort of depressing actually um or they go the other way and they try to make something where there's threat but the threat is totally ludicrous and you end up with very cartoony and very goofy games there's not so many of those around at the moment but you know the monkey island is the classic example but you you kind of also have your colorful platformers your kind of goofy platformers um which have threat but everybody knows it's not serious and we wanted to find something that kind of walked in the middle of that that felt more like an indiana jones movie we quite often go back to indiana jones as our kind of tonal point it, mm. you know it's fun it's exciting it definitely isn't serious but it's not goofy it's not throwaway either it's kind of solid Saturday matinee type stuff and an 80 days felt like a concept that could do that for us while have that kind of tone while still providing a really clear challenge and hook this this race around the world it's there in the title everybody who picks it up knows exactly what it is they're supposed to be doing you don't really have to tutorialize anything it's just traveling around the world and that is such a clean and clear idea but it also gave us an enormous amount of scope for all the stuff we like all the branching and the exploration and and a world filled with characters. I think one of the things we'd learn on our previous games, on the sorcery games, was that when you're exploring a world in text, when you're exploring interactive fiction, actually it's characters that bring it to life. Like you can have settings and you can have puzzles and they're okay, but really talking to people is the heart and soul of it. That's what feels really good. Um, so 80 Days, let's make a game. I think it has a cast of 5,000 people in it, um, which is probably the highest of any computer game ever. Apart from possibly some procedurally generated ones and probably Red Dead Redemption 2, which no doubt has 10 million people in it. Who knows? But um, yeah, so it kind of it, it was this it was this concept that just brought a lot of things together. And I think one of the things after it came out was we kind of cast around for a concept that was as strong as 80 days and never really found one in the same genre. Um, we sort of expected to do other Jules Verne books because it seemed the natural thing to do, but none of them none of them quite worked in the same way. So I think it was, it really was the perfect idea for us in a lot of ways. I mean, uh, 80 days does stand out among Jules Verne's works. And, you know, it's like, I can see why it, works so well for uh, treading that balance line because you know there's an anti there's an antagonistic figure in 80 days but it, you know it's a police detective working off of a case of uh mistaken identity it's not somebody who's really threatening to kill Phineas Hogg or any of his compatriots and otherwise yeah. it's fairly open ended i mean they have an itinerary but yeah. Compared to like around or, or twenty thousand leagues under the sea, where like you don't have a whole lot of options when you're in a submarine and you're not the captain. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, one of the ideas that we we tossed around afterwards was um, Journey to the Center of the Earth, which of Verne's books I've only read a few of Verne's books, but that's my favorite. It's got dinosaurs in it. It's, <laughs> it's awesome, but. As a computer game setting, it's really dull because you're just in a cave all the time and there's no one there to talk to. So while the book is claustrophobic and exciting and it's all about getting lost and running out of supplies and rations, actually, we tried locking it up 
and it was just this 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 brown cave that you were stuck in for the whole thing we just thought this is dull <laughs> um so yeah i think 80 days has it has that vibrancy doesn't doesn't it it has that like the diversity you, you, you can literally put anything into 80 days um and find a place for it to be you know it's yeah difficult in his other books i think yeah. it's especially poignant since um if people have been watching our previous uh let's play episodes it's a it's not a straight adaptation that is to say it's a lot more steampunky than uh, the actual book yeah yeah so the steampunk thing was a funny thing for us because i think on the one hand neither joe nor i nor meg giants who did the bulk of the writing on the game none of us particularly like steampunk we don't dislike it but we don't really like it it's not a go-to genre or anything but partly we wanted it there for design reasons because we wanted the player to be able to go around the world any which way they wanted and in reality if you go to africa in 1872 you're not going to get around the world it's not going to help you at all there's no reason to do that um so we needed to introduce some kind of fantastical element to make that a valid playthrough on the other hand we also had this sense that when people think of Jules Verne, they think of steampunk. Um, everybody sort of, if you ask people if Around the World in 80 Days has got steampunk elements in it, the book, I think most people would, would, wouldn't would be entirely sure whether it did or it didn't, because we think of Verne as a science fiction writer in that way. So it felt like a natural fit, even though it isn't actually in the novel. And I think we quickly realized that what was in the novel wasn't entirely important. What mattered was whether it felt like 80 days, not whether it actually was 80 days or not. So we, we riffed on some things in the book. We threw some things in the book completely away because we didn't like them. There's a whole bit about losing shoes in the book, which we just, you know, whatever. It's not important. Um, <laughs> and of course, we added a huge, huge, huge amount of stuff. So, you know, once we were into the project and we knew our world, and we knew our characters, we were just writing whatever we felt like, I think. Um, but I think Vern would have liked it. I think he would have been happy. I can, uh, I can definitely see the point. And it's also steampunk, uh, the only thing that makes sense from a technological standpoint, because even if you start going, you know, one era ahead with like diesel punk, you're cutting that 80 days time down significantly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think that's that's a real danger with the concept in some ways is that if you even push it slightly too hard, 80 days is a really, really long period of time to get around the world for us. And you know, you, it's only just possible in the real 1872, but it's really quite simple even by like 1910, 1920, you know, when the aeroplane is kind of becoming a solid object. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of even even before they could fly around the Pacific, you know, they could do short hops on aeroplanes. So, and I, I think finding that window gave it a nice kind of creative tension. Like what was the most outlandish technology we could get into the game without breaking the fundamental conceit of the game? So there are mechanical elephants and there are airships, but there is definitely no jet engines and that's kind of important. And even then, I even then I feel like the uh, the fact that everybody is massively uncomfortable with cars is probably something of a balancing factor. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. That was definitely a thing, you know, in not so much 1872, but like uh, 20 years later when cars started appearing. Mm. Like, you know, it's like new technology just does that to people. Yeah, people are quite quite freaked out about it. There's all that lovely old video footage you can see of. of like Times Square in 1910, where there's one car driving down the road and there's a bunch of people walking around in, in front of it who don't really seem to realize they need to run out of the way of this car that's going at 20 miles an hour. And then at the last minute, they jump out of the way. And you can, these very grainy old early films uh, where the dynamic on the roads is just, it's unrecognizable. Like to us, roads are places where cars live and you try to stand on them as little as possible because they will kill you. Whereas back then, the road was this, it was literally a highway. Just people wandered around it as much as they liked. There were horses and there were people carrying things and people sitting down. And like, I love, I love that. I love the idea of roads as spaces that are almost like parks. <laughs> I just think that's brilliant. Hmm. And was there any particular aspect of 80 Days that you struggled to adapt to uh, this new format? That's interesting. I mean, I think... The whole project was incredibly difficult to design and get right. We, we, we certainly 
I remember there was a point during development when Joe described it brilliantly and he said it was like literally biting off more than you could chew that you'd, you'd take a problem or a, a thing that wasn't working and you'd you'd sort of chew it over and you'd try and just about get your mouth around it and you'd sort of by the end of the week maybe have figured it out and then next week you'd do it all over again and kind of every element of the design went through a lot of iterations just to find out where the right balance is were like how complicated did the choice of journeys need to be how much strategy was there how much strategy wasn't there you know did we want a policeman character following you around the world was that a thing that we needed or wanted and in the end we didn't have um but a lot of that is just straightforward design in some ways it's, i think the problem wasn't so much because of the adaptation from 80 days it was more that we were designing a game that we had never ever seen before so um you know, I don't, I can't think of any other computer games which are race games in the way that 80 Days is, uh, where you're trying to get through something as fast as possible, but it's not a Twitch mechanic, it's a strategy mechanic. And it's sort of a survival game, I suppose, that's something that it's close to, because you're stat balancing, but the stats it, are It is quite... a particular upper-class man with frail constitution kind of survival <laughs> yeah, game. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, some people compared it to the Oregon Trail, and I think that's not a bad comparison, actually. Because you have that thing of you are managing stats, but you don't really know what any of them do or what any of them are doing. You might eventually figure it out, but on a first play, you have to play with your gut more than more than adding up numbers or anything. Um, so I, I I remember that all being quite quite taxing. But I mostly most of the work actually that I did on the game was partly writing. I, I wrote it with Meg, but. Also, just redrafting and trying to get the flow of the text to be really good and to get the make sure all the choices were good choices and there weren't too many and they weren't too few and all that. And they really affected the game and all that kind of just really getting stuck into making sure that there was always something interesting happening. Um, but that was a delight. That was such a fun job. It's the most fun. Um, yeah. I don't think I even read the whole book until after. <laughs> I'd only read the <laughs> Well, no, I've never actually read the actual book, but I've seen adaptations of uh, 80 Days. Like, I remember a talking animal version of yes. the work, like, back in, you know, back when I was a kid. You know, yeah, yeah. Was Phineas Fox. So. Yes. Yeah, no, I'm pretty sure the talking animal version is, it was like a French cartoon that was dubbed into English um, that was on the telly when I was a kid. I'm pretty sure that's what I had in my head when we started the project. So that's kind of, um, yeah, it, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Like, anyway, um, now, we are also here to talk about the Nintendo Switch version of 80 Days, because this, this game came out two months ago, as you mentioned. Yeah, that's right. And the first thing I'm wondering is, what was it like coming back to this project after five years and adapting it to a new platform? You know, uh, yeah. what, what, was there any problems like updating the code? So it was it was just so nice. It was such a nice thing to do. It was like it was like. It was like I, I, it was like just being given a present because by the time five years have gone by, you've sort of forgotten most of the hard work that you did to make the game, and um, you know the, the, even the code base was mostly it was in Unity, so it was mostly just a process of updating from one version of Unity to another version of Unity, which is tedious, but it's not difficult work, and it doesn't require you to think through very much. Um, so it was just like having this this lovely present or like having a like if your parents had a summer house, right? my parents don't have a summer house, but if your parents had a summer house, but they never told you that they had a summer house. And then one day they just say, oh, by the way, here's the keys to our summer house. And you go to the summer house and it's lovely and you have to dust it down a bit. But basically, you've got a summer house that's just appeared from nowhere. It was a bit like that. It was a bit like just having a free holiday dumped on you because here was this game that we knew we liked that we enjoyed playing that we couldn't remember that well so it was actually quite fun to play test which is really unusual when you're shipping a game um and there wasn't that much work in getting it to work but there was quite a bit of work in getting it to be nice so we did quite a lot of work on partly just making sure the ui worked with the, the switch controls obviously but 
things like the switch has really lovely haptic feedback it does little buzzes and vibrations and rolls and rumbles and things they're quite there's quite a lot you can do with them and so we had loads of fun making those for buttons which is a thing that we would not done before because it's just polished because we didn't have to worry about whether the game was any good or not because we know it's good so we didn't have to just that wasn't that whole problem we've gone away so it was it was like a, it was the closest thing to a holiday you can have while still actually doing your job I think it was just lovely. <laughs> it was just a lovely, lovely process from beginning right. to end. Gotta admit, that's the uh, first time I've ever heard uh, porting duties described like that. <laughs> yeah, no, it was fine. I mean, I, I'll confess, I didn't do the bulk of the actual Unity code mm -hmm. work that was done by Tom Kale, who's one of our developers. Um, right. But I think he was really enjoying himself anyway, because uh, for much the same reason that it was, you know, there was an end product at the end of it, which was solid and we knew it worked and anyway he's a big switch fan so he was really excited to get something going on the switch mm. uh, now you mentioned that the, uh, there were issues making the game play nice with the switch was that just a matter of adapting the ui and the controls to it you know an actual controller scheme or were there more deep down technical issues you had to iron out as well no, it was mostly just controls, actually, just making sure the thumbsticks worked because it, you know, it's been on PC before and it's been on um, touchscreen devices. And well, the Switch has a touchscreen, but yes. we, you can't make it rely only on that. Um, the only the, the the biggest quirk of the Switch version really is making it handle the two modes because we wanted to make sure that it played really nicely in TV mode, so that you can, you know, you put it on the TV and sit on the couch and. And it makes quite a nice co-op game to play with people. You can argue about your decisions and the font's a bit bigger and that kind of stuff, and just making it sit nicely. But in terms of technical difficulties, there weren't really any actually at all. Like um, partly, I guess, Unity was quite well set up for Switch development by the time we got around to doing it, because the Switch wasn't that new anymore. Um, and partly just, it's a game that's all about the, the content, but not that much about the technical stuff. Like there isn't, there isn't a massive amount of complex rendering going on in this game, actually. I mean, it looks beautiful. I think Joe did a great job with the, the graphic design of it and the coloring of it and things like that. But um, it's not like we have to worry about draw distances. So we're, we're currently porting Heaven's Vault to the Switch, and that's proving a lot, lot harder because now we're trying to crush kind of the graphics of a, an open world PlayStation 4 game down onto the Switch. And yeah, that's actually a significant technical challenge that's taking a lot of time. Um, and a lot of thought and 80 days by comparison was just it was just a brief <laughs> right we'll get into the sp uh, specifications of heaven's vault in a little bit but sure. um you know and to wrap up 80 days um uh how has the switch version been doing in the marketplace in the e-shop since it's released yeah i think we're happy i mean i've got nothing to compare it to because it is a five-year-old game but it's also it's also quite a weird genre of game, right? So when, when we released 80 Days in the first place, we had a lot of people saying, oh, this game's amazing, you should try it. And then other people saying, well, I don't know, it doesn't look like my sort of game. And we, a lot, a lot of the story of that game sort of making its mark was that it, it took a long, long time for people to really play 80 Days because people would look at it and say, oh, I don't like that kind of game. And it took a while for people to try it and then say, oh, right, I, I don't like that kind of game, but I like this game. Um, and I can't explain why, but there we go. That, that seems to be the, the, the result that 80 Days managed to get was people who don't really like interactive fiction decided they did like 80 Days. Um, but that puts us in a weird position now releasing on the Switch because all the people who know that they like 80 Days have probably played it already on PC or iOS or whatever, you know, several years ago. And some of those people come back to it and get a new copy of it. And some people feel that they've played it and that's fine. But, so we have a whole new group of people that we have to convince all over again that even though they've heard that 80 Days is a great game, that actually even though they think they don't like that kind of game, that they will like this particular game. And it's back to that old conversation again. So it, I feel like it's always going to be a bit of a slow burner just because it's always been a slow burner. Um, you know, it was crazy when, when we first released 80 Days. It came out on the Apple, came out on just Apple phones. And Apple promoted it, and that sold for a bit, and then Apple stopped promoting it, which is what Apple do. And then it died. It completely died for eight months. And then it turned up in lots of Game of the Year lists, and it started getting BAFTA nominations, and suddenly it started to sell. But there was this eight-month period when, as far as we were concerned, it was over. And then it went on to be this thing that funded you know, the next four years of our company. So 
Whether that will happen with the Switch version or not, I have no idea because no one gives awards or Game of the Year nominations to games that are old. People, I have this feeling people will just sort of slowly discover it over time. But yeah, it it it's just you can't compare it to anything else. It's not like releasing a port of a recent game. It's not like releasing a port of a a really. It's not like releasing a port of Grand Theft Auto Three, which everybody knows exactly what it is. It's this. It's always been a weird thing, and it's still a weird thing. So you just have to keep telling people, by the way, this game is really actually quite good, you know, um, and see if you can convince them. <laughs> that does make sense. And as you mentioned, 80 days is quite the odd duck, especially yeah. on something like the Switch. Sorry? Uh, especially on the uh, the Switch. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. I, I don't know that. I mean, there might be some, vis well, there must be lots of visual novels and things on the Switch, I suppose, but like text-based interactive fiction on a console does feel like an odd idea. It's actually my favorite platform to play it on now because it has that handheld form factor and it's kind of responsive and snappy, but the screen's nice and big. And I like the fact that you can play it on the TV as well. I think that's actually really surprisingly comfortable to do. Um, we weren't really sure when we started the port if that would work at all, but I, I think it's really nice. Um, but... <laughs> But like I kind of help, I can't help thinking, yeah, it's an unusual idea. But if it's good, it's good, you know. Like there should be space in the world for things which are good, even if they're not like other things that come before. I hope there is. Like that's a whole conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, believe me, there's a lot of good stuff in the world that doesn't get its recognition. Yeah, that's true. That. <laughs> Um, anyway, before we transition over to Heaven's Vault, I do have a question about the Sorcery series. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm not sure if you can answer this right now, but um, given that you're porting your other games to the Nintendo Switch, um, could you see the Sorcery series exist on that platform as well? So, from a, from a sort of design artistic point of view, I would love to have the Sorcery games on the Switch, because Sorcery is, if, if 80 Days is an odd duck, then Sorcery is a really odd duck. Um, there are people who played it because they liked the old game books. There are people who played it because it looked interesting, but it, it really never got very much recognition at all, despite being played by, I think about a million and a half people have played Sorcery One now because it's been out so long and, and been in so many different places and bundles and, and things like that. But somehow it, it we, we had this weird thing that when 80 Days came out, people said, we love this game. We think it's amazing. It's brilliant. It's wonderful. What are you doing next? And we said, well, we've got this game called Sorcery. And people said, yeah, we're not going to play that. And we'd say, well, why not? They'd say, oh, I don't like that kind of game. And we'd say, but you just said that about eight. Oh, never mind. So, um, I, <laughs> so I would love to, to bring the Sorcery games back up again and say, look, here's this thing. Because I think one thing about the, the kind of text-based games that we design is they don't date, they don't get old. The fact that the first Sorcery game is now eight years old, it doesn't matter. It looks as fresh as the day we built it, really. It's a bit skewamorphic for modern bone design, but apart from that. Um, but the reality is that we built the Sorcery games on... We didn't build them on Unity. We built them on Apple's own code base in uh, Objective-C, which is a kind of curious programming language that Apple phones used. And then we found a way to get that to port over to Steam. But anyway, actually technically getting them onto the Switch is quite a bit harder. Um, I mean, we might even need to rewrite things from scratch. And doing that is a huge amount of work. So it's, it's quite unlikely that we will, just because they weren't built in a way that was particularly forward, okay. forward thinking, which is a real shame. It's a real shame. Um, but I guess that's the story of a lot of games over the years. Too true. Too true. Uh, I mean, and, you know, especially with older games, th this is like some of the concerns I had about 80 Days. They're written on, um, sometimes they're written on non-compatible code bases or non-compatible engines and so on and so forth. And it turns out that's a lot of extra work. And this is how you get things like Saints Row the Third on the Nintendo Switch. Mm. Like, mm. So most unfortunate to hear, but understandable as well. Yeah. I mean, you never know what's going to happen. Uh, like, and yeah. you never know what will, what will get easier and what will get harder what other people will do you know i recently i recently read that the blade runner adventure game is now available to play because the modding community has fixed it and it's been unplayable for the last sort of 10 12 years and it's one of the best point and click adventure games from the uh, from the late 90s and it's full of really interesting ideas 
Um, and here's this thing, and it's come back to life. And I don't know if anyone's picked it up, but they really should. And now they can. So I guess these things ebb and flow a little bit, but who knows? But yeah, no. In the immediate future, no. We've got we've got no plans to get sorcery onto the switch, despite the fact it would be brilliant. <laughs> uh, once again, lamentable. But anyway, so moving forward to you know the latest project. Yeah, uh, Heaven's Vault. Um, you know, I think we touched upon this like years back, just when it was like uh, much more in a work working development state. Mm. Um, but uh, you wanted to incorporate language um, to a greater degree than you had previously, if I'm remembering correctly. Mm. And, um, and indeed, uh, having played Heaven's Vault, uh, language is at the center of this particular interactive fiction game. And my question is, what fueled the desire to, you know, examine the nature of language um especially from a historical archaeological standpoint yeah so i think it's funny when you look at the way that the ideas kind of come about or that, that games get built especially because we're always trying things that like i said before that we haven't really seen anywhere else we didn't start heaven's vault with the idea of language at all Actually, we started Heaven's Vault with, with simply the idea that space archaeology was a cool genre that no one had really done. That was our kind of entry into this. Uh -huh. And from there, we started to think about what is it that archaeologists actually do? And I did quite a bit of reading about this, and I spoke to some archaeologists, and I kind of got a bit of a picture of it. And, um, you know, a lot of it is about evidence, and a lot of it is about slowly, scientifically putting things together. But it's also very material. It's obsessed with... Um, the stuff that things are made of and where that stuff came from and the mechanisms that people use to build things and the shape of the walls of the house of the whatever um and all this kind of physical evidence stuff but one thing that i know from narrative and from writing is that an environment is only so interesting but people are always incredibly interesting that if you do your environmental storytelling in a game you know when you go into a, a house and there's a little vignette of something that's happened in this house that you're finding out about by looking at the objects the objects themselves are not interesting to any great extent it's what happened to the people which becomes the thing that you walk away with the thing that you remember about that little scene and what we were finding was that the Although we liked the theme of archaeology, the business of doing archaeology didn't get us to actually interacting with the people in the past. But we we also didn't want to There's go too far. A lot less fi. avoiding death traps than I was than I was than I yeah, was. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And that's where a lot you know uh, there was definitely points in the design where Joe would say, well, "Okay, but what does our, our archaeologist do?" And I would say, "I don't know, pressure pads and levers and stuff." Um, but of course, that's got nothing to do with archaeology or people either. Um, and then I, 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 about halfway through development, I was playing Horizon Zero Dawn, which has archaeological moments in it. And the way that they solve this problem is they have sort of holographic recordings, you know, audio logs, basically, that come up where you talk, where you can listen to people from the past talking about stuff. And we kind of didn't want to do that either. We didn't want to do a sort of sci-fi oh, here they are, you know, you, you've got your mysteries of archaeology, and then finally you find a recording, and up pops Bob, and he can just tell you what this building was or what it was for. And you go, oh, well, I don't know why I was bothering to think about it. I should have just asked Bob. There he is. Those are the answers. Um, we felt that that was kind of letting, letting down the spirit of archaeology. And so all those kind of worries kind of floated around. And then in the middle was this idea of translating inscription, because... As a gameplay activity, we thought it sounded interesting and like something we hadn't really seen and something that could work as a puzzle, but also quite a soft puzzle so that it didn't need to block you, which we, we were quite interested and excited to design for. But also when you read an inscription, every inscription has been written by a person with something to say and some thought behind it, and it means something. So you are communicating with the people from the past, but you're still not actually getting to to shake them by the shoulders and demand answers from them, which was the thing that we wanted to make sure we didn't allow the player to do. So there's the, the inscriptions mean that you have a barrier between you and the people in the past, but it's a barrier you can kind of see through. And we felt like that was just right tonally. Um, and so that then got us to thinking about language in more depth and how it works. And we started to make all the discoveries that I think players make when they play Heaven's Vault that 
the language starts off looking like a puzzle, but actually it's full of meaning in and of itself. So, you know, we suddenly got really excited when we realized that the way that we built the ancient word for emperor could tell you what people thought about emperors, because whether the word for emperor means, you know, he who protects the people or whether it means she who controls the people yeah. tells you an enormous thing. Um, mm -hmm. And that we could hide that within the structure of the language itself. And then if people found it, great. And if they didn't find it, that's also fine. And that was amazing. And I think once we realized that, that was when the project really took off for us, because suddenly we suddenly then we actually knew what the heart of this thing was. It was about all the ways we could create a real breathing universe with a real history full of real people and hide it in plain sight. Um, and if you've played the game in any, if you play the game through, uh, then you'll know that the biggest of all these revelations is in the title of the game itself. But I won't say anything more about that in case people haven't played it. Um, yeah. But the point where we realized what we could do with the title was literally just a victory lap moment. We all just ran around the office going, that's brilliant. And it was, you know, those, those moments of being excited about what your concept can do are just the best part of creating anything really so it was quite a long process of discovery i think it was about a year before we really understood what the shape of heaven's vault actually was um and then it took you know three more years to actually build the damn thing but uh yeah i look back on it with so much pride i'm really glad that we thought about it as much as we did think about it because i think there were a lot of versions of the game that we we almost made that just didn't have the right heart to them and would have come out as just you know adventure games just solid adventure games but without that kind of defining thing that makes it different and i think as designers we wouldn't have been happy with that mm. but, I, but it was hard <laughs> i don't doubt it i mean th this is a um like how many words how many symbols how much of this language did you actually create so the the way that the language is built is a mixture of authored stuff and procedural stuff. Um, so as we didn't have to write an entire dictionary and make sure that all of it was consistent with itself, we, we wrote some rules and we also write some core data. And that balance took a little while to get right, but I think we, we did get it right. The final dictionary at the moment, I think, is three and a half thousand words of ancient. And I, I remember there was a moment it was really towards the end of development, actually. It was about a month or two before we shipped our kind of first master build to PlayStation. Um, when something tipped over that in previously, when I'd been thinking, oh, I want to write an inscription that says this. So I would go to the dictionary and I would try to write it and I would find that I was missing a, a keyword. So I'd, you know, I'd invent that word and I'd put it into the lexicon and then I'd be able to write my inscription. And that was generally how the language built. It sort of built new words when we needed them. And then there was this point about two months before development when suddenly everything that I wanted to say, I could say. And that was incredible. And I remember I did, I did a talk about the design of the translation game. And for fun, I thought I'd translate some things and put them on slides just to show them. So I translated the opening paragraph of Pride and Prejudice and the lyrics for Get Lucky by Daft Punk. And they just translated. You could just do it. The words were all there. All the words that you needed to express these things were there. And that was incredible because then you think, oh, wow, we have actually made a language at this point. There is there is enough in here that every concept I need to express, I can find a way to express. And that's that makes it a full language. Um, I think I read now, somewhere. Now, that... is it mostly a language or is it mostly like a cipher where like most of the phrase, most of like the sentence structure and stuff is the same as in English or whatever? So I think that's. I'm not sure that's really a distinction because even a language has a grammar, even if the language happens to be the same grammar as English has. But I, I, I know that the point of the question is, is it, is it a cipher? Is the idea that you turn each bit of it back into English and then you read it off? And I think it isn't. It, the grammar is largely the same as English, mostly because every time we tried to tweak the grammar, we found that you would solve a puzzle but not actually be able to understand what the phrase says. Um, mm -hmm. And that was too many levels of confusion. Like you'd, you'd, you'd have to guess what these words were, and then you'd have to guess what the heck it was you'd written in the first place. And that didn't feel very satisfying. So we, we would constantly put in grammar quirks and then take them back out again and go, actually, we don't need that. That's not helping us. Um, but there are differences in the grammar here and there. 
but the most of what it's really interested in is in the construction of the words themselves, which is very non-English. So mm -hmm. each, it's built of these glyphs. Every glyph has a concept, and then the concepts compound together in ways that have a reason to be the way that they are, um, which is a bit the way that actually Finnish works a bit like that, and Chinese works a bit like that, and, and German does it with nouns, but rather not so much with little phonemes. Um, and Grant English doesn't do any of that at all. Um, and in that sense, at that point, it's not a cipher, which is kind of interesting because a lot of people playing it, they sort of they assume that it's a cipher. So we had a lot of people sort of saying, oh, well, that squiggly one, that must be a K. And then that wiggly one, that must be an I to make the word king. And we we, we had this at, at shows. We took it to PAX and things like that. And we'd watch people doing this. And we think, well, how do we tutorialize that this is not a letter substitution cipher mm -hmm. when that's what people assume that it is going into it? And how do we do that like on the Steam page? Because we don't want people to look at this game and think, oh, it's a, it's a letter substitution cipher. Because... I wouldn't want to play that myself. I think I've done those. I don't need a computer game version of those. Yeah, I um, didn't mean letter substitutions. I meant more like on the full like word slash sure. phrase structure. Or well, there's a whole that, that, that kind of a whole spectrum, isn't there? Mm -hmm. um, and it's difficult because I think actually what we need to do is show people how how the words are built out of the other words, so that they get a sense of what the actual gameplay is. But it's such an odd idea. It's very hard to tutorialize that or kind of communicate it quickly. So I, I don't know. I don't think it is quite a language because it's not phonetic. You don't speak it. Um, and the grammar is quite similar to English, but not identical to English, but just as much as it needs to be, really. Um, so somewhere in between, I guess. I don't know. It's what we thought was fun to play, I guess, ultimately. <laughs> Oh, I'm like, uh, uh, oh, right. Um, now what was the hardest part of constructing this, you know, language, pseudo language, however you want to define it? Mm. Um, I think the hardest part was, was actually figuring out what the player was going to do. Once, once we knew what the player was going to do, then the, the rules of the language kind of fell out of that. Like, what, what, what's, what's the player going to be interested in doing? What are they going to be not interested in doing? And that, that, that was a useful way of figuring that out. But to start with, just we went through lots of different versions of, you know, just how big is your list of words that you know on the screen? Are you dragging and dropping or clicking or dropping down? Or do you type things in or... And when you choose a translation for a word, do you choose it from a, a huge dictionary of options or a tiny dictionary of options? And when you put a translation in, when do we tell you that you're correct or do we ever tell you that you're correct? And all of those decisions to work out what the loop of it was going to be, that was the hardest thing because we had no idea what the right answer was. And we would build one and try it and sometimes have to try it for quite a while before we saw, oh, hang on, wait, this is being... This is not helping me enough. I, I'm getting into a complete muddle and I've got no idea what anything says. And then I've stopped reading what the glyphs are and I'm not playing the game anymore. Or, or this version over here is, is not letting me finish a translation until I've got it completely right, at which point I can brute force it. So I immediately start brute forcing it. And again, I'm not reading what the words actually say. And like one of the key design moments was um, when we... So when you get a translation, the first thing you do, it's usually, usually, is it's compacted together, is you drop words you already know onto it, and you kind of space it out to find words that you don't know. And that was a really key piece of design when we tried it, because we realized that meant that people were picking up the words they'd already found and using them, which meant that they read them and they remembered them. They kind of handled them, so they learned them, and that was the thing that made people start to actually look at what the symbols in the words were was the fact that they spend a bit of time just putting them into the right places doing this kind of it's almost like a jigsaw but but it has this step of making you own the language which is a really subtle point but um when we put that in and we really weren't sure that it wasn't going to just be a tedious and annoying and perhaps some players think it is but it completely revolutionized the way that people related to the language. And that was kind of a key moment. But that wasn't hard exactly. It was just weird because we had this thing that wasn't really working and we did a design step and suddenly it worked really well. We were like, right, nobody touch anything. We're not allowed to change it now. We don't know why it worked. Um, from there, it was mostly just kind of trying 
I, I think you get this a lot in design in general, actually. You have a core idea that works and you know when it works because it, it, it shines. And then all you have to do is expand it without breaking it. So you keep adding things and checking that you haven't thrown away what was good about it in the first place. And if you're lucky, you can get that to extend across the entire game without anyone messing it up. And then and then you're done. Um, and it was very it was very much like that. I think once we had our working prototype, we knew that it was the heart of the game. We just had to not not break it. <laughs> so we just tried to not break it. Uh, well, I suppose the question that beckons is uh, how did the language break at any point? I mean, you mentioned like before the show started that the bugs have appeared in the game. Oh, no. so before the before the game started, uh, before the show started, rather, um, yeah, I idly meant we, we, we have a, a Discord channel where people kind of chat about the storyline of the game and, and ask for hints and things. And some people are really into the language. And occasionally we have some people there who say, oh, I, you know, I found a bug in the language that the, this word should be this, but it's actually that. And I mean, sometimes they have a point and sometimes we, we have tweaked the language of it uh, over the course of the year. But I love the idea of there being a bug in the language because can a language even have a bug? I mean, I, sometimes I just want to write back and say, no, that's just the way the ancients said it. You know, it, it might not make sense to you, but you're not an ancient, so there you go. It's um, not a bug, it's, it's a feature. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's an idiom. That's what it is. Um, <laughs> so that's kind of, that. that's, yeah, that's, we always have to be a little bit careful when we get feedback. Um, like that, that we don't just we don't just accept it, but we kind of try to think, well, it, how does this fit with what we have? Um, we've definitely done a bunch of work, even post release, actually, on just making kind of especially supporting longer translations better, because you can play the game and then play the game again and play the game again. And unlike most adventure games, it's different every time you play it, so there's always more things to explore or discover. And the translations you do get longer and more complicated on every playthrough of the game because they're semi-procedural. Um, so there's always new things to be to be reading and learning. But that means that we have some players now who are on their fifth or sixth playthrough. You know, they're up to their 100-hour mark or whatever, which for an adventure game, I think is quite, really quite strong. Um, but they're, you know, they're routinely dealing with, with translations that are several screens wide. And so we've done a fair bit of work to try and optimize the UI for those people because we, we hadn't, you know, there were things that we can make their lives better. Um, that we hadn't done before release. So that's been kind of interesting. But it isn't really breaking the language so much as just trying to keep the flow of it as good towards the end of the game as it is, you know, at the very, very early stages of the game or kind of on the first or second playthrough. Um, yeah. Indeed. Now, here's something I'm really wondering about. You know, um, in all of this transliteration, we've been talking about, you know, transliterating this language into English. Mm -hmm. But um, that's not the only uh, language that exists, obviously. Um, yeah. My question is about localization efforts. Uh, how, you know, has this game been translated into like French, Italian, Russian, uh, all, you know, major languages? Yeah, no, we, we actually haven't localized any of our games to date at all. And, but the funny thing is that it's not really because of the translation game. We actually, when we built that, we did have in the back of our minds that we might want to localize it. So we kind of, we mostly left that door open. The real problem is the, the rest of the game, the kind of the story engine in the game, because our stories are, they're built in a very dynamic way. So the engine, the engine which works out what each character is going to say next is constantly messing with the words that the characters use or changing what they're talking about or linking from one topic to another topic. And a lot of that is assembled on the fly. Hopefully it doesn't look that way. Hopefully it looks like it's all been written by a human. But um, the reality is we, we break up sentences and glue them back together in a procedural way pretty much all the time in Heaven's Vault. Um, we do it in 80 Days in Sorcery as well. And translating that is it's essentially impossible because um, that really does rely on the quirks and the exact construction of English. You know, even handling gendered nouns in Romance languages or something like that would would be a whole tier of work to do on top of the story engine. And we wouldn't be able to check it because we don't actually speak Italian or French or Spanish well enough to be able to check that. Um, and then if you go to kind of Russian or Chinese or, or Finnish or languages that are very differently structured indeed, Arabic, um, 
then it, it becomes almost impossible for us. I think localization is one of those things which you really have to be intending to do from the beginning. And in terms of what you can do with the dynamic writing of your game, it limits you enormously, which I wasn't quite, I wasn't quite willing to do for Heaven's Vault. Um, which is a shame because you know there's obviously there's millions of people out there in the world who who don't speak English and I wish they could play our games and I feel bad that they can't. We we routinely get letters from people saying please please translate eighty days into Portuguese or to Turkish and I think well I wish I could but I really don't think we can. Um, but no, so we haven't tackled it. We haven't. We have found though that uh, like in uh, in foreign countries where they don't speak English as their first language, but people have enough of a working vocabulary and whatever that they can read English. The translation game doesn't appear to pose a problem. So Heaven's Vault is quite big in France. Um, mm. They really liked it in France. It got like a 10 out, 10 out of 10 from Le Monde when they reviewed it. Um, and yeah, there, there doesn't seem to be any complaint from the French player base that the translation game is difficult to play. And I think probably because the grammar is quite similar to English and they're already used to that, that it, it's not too bad. But I, I would love to talk in more detail to someone, you know, French or Italian or whatever, about how they find it. And if there are any quirks with it, but I, I don't, I don't think that's the biggest problem that they'd have. I think the biggest problem they'd have is actually just reading the rest of the text. Yeah, I get what you're saying. You know, it's like the entire story has been built in English, and transliterating that into different languages has a whole host of problems. Yeah, and there's really there really are a lot of words. Um, <laughs> it's like we occasionally get offers from translators for 80 days who say oh you know I'll, i'm starting out i'll do it for free and we say no you really don't want to translate three quarters of a million words of dynamic english in because you'll still be doing it five years from now <laughs> just no it's not a good idea no 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 it's not i mean there, and there's so much to touch upon this game but unfortunately our time is running low so just a couple more questions um go for it you know, it's like, I suppose, before we do wrap up, we should talk about the Nintendo Switch version, because that's currently in development. Yeah, that's right. The Nintendo Switch version is in development. It's almost done. We are, it, it's basically just about getting the frame rate to be really, really snappy and nice. So that's quite a lot of art optimization and making sure that it just flows really, really nicely. The UI is mostly done. Um, it's been quite hard and there's been quite a lot of technical work under the hood to make everything work, especially the rendering of the nebula, which is sort of a big, very beautiful, very dynamically lit space, but it's also enormous. Um, but that's all coming together quite well. So I, we do not have a release date to announce yet, but it is almost ready and we're looking forward to releasing it. Like, um, and have there been any compromises made to get it on the Nintendo Switch? Uh, there are some visual things that we've had to do. Um, I don't think anyone's going to really notice them. I mean, some of them is just turning on features which most games have, which we didn't need to turn on on the PlayStation. So things like um, uh, there's a thing called occlusion, where if there's a wall in the way, it, the game stops drawing the things behind the wall. And we don't actually do that on the PlayStation because our environments are quite lightweight. We didn't need to. On the Switch, we do that. It's been a lot of work to set up, but you won't actually notice the difference at all when you're playing it because you couldn't see through the wall anyway. Um, I think in space, we might have very slightly increased the kind of fog distance so that the, the, the draw distance is slightly lower. Um, but a lot of space is clouds and rocks anyway. So again, I, I think you'd have, you'd be quite hard pressed to notice. I think we're generally really proud of the visual fidelity that we've managed to get onto the Switch and get out of the Switch. And I think the frame rate's gone up quite a lot as well, actually. So it should it should probably end up being the nicest version to play because it's had that extra time and love in the optimization process, um, which you can get post-release, which you can do post-release. And um, in regards to the Nintendo Switch version, is it going to be the same price as the other versions? Do you know, I have no idea. We haven't figured it out yet, so I probably shouldn't say anything. <laughs> it's going to be roughly the same price, but whether it's exactly the same or not, I'm not sure. Um, that's actually understandable because uh, there is this thing called the Switch tax, and uh, Switch games, for various reasons, have been more expensive than their... Uh, you know, like PC or other console counterparts. Um, yeah. But I will also note uh, a usual reason for that is a physical edition. Um, and that leads me to my final question. 
have you given consideration to physical versions of 80 Days or Heaven's Vault on the Nintendo Switch? I would absolutely love to do that, but that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> I'm like, uh, tease for the future? Possibly. Hope so. <laughs> we'll see. All right. Um, and now I'm going to ask if my colleagues here have any final questions for you. I think mine have been answered. Uh, you actually answered most of the questions. I, I had some questions about if there was any intended pronunciation ideas, but it sounds like that wasn't really what you're going for with the language. So yeah, which makes sense because I'm sure there are plenty of ancient languages that we have no idea how the heck they were actually pronounced. Well, if you um, if you play the game in detail, there is actually a spoken version of ancient in it, but it's kind of it's kind of a deeper level of mystery to be explored. Mm -hmm. um, so it's there for there for the language nerds, but no one else needs to worry about it too much. Duly noted. And on that note, um, we are going to end this broadcast of Fragments of Silicon. Um, indeed, be sure to join us on our Sunday review show. Um, and until then, we wish you good gaming. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm.